to short or not uh, in conjunction with markets.com. That is the question we're going to try and answer. I've broken it down into particular areas that we will focus on. I'm not going to short everything. That would be silly. Uh, Markets.com. They're now trading the SA40 uh, index, so you can trade the SA40 uh, on the platform. You can find them LinkedIn, you can find them Twitter, and of course you find them at Markets.com. So first, shorting. Well, a couple of folks said to me when we started marketing this presentation, what are we talking about with shorting? What do we mean? What are we thinking? Well, in essence, it's making profit as a market falls. You sell something you don't own, you buy it back for cheaper. So you sell something at 10 bucks, it falls to nine, you buy it back at nine, and you've made that one rand difference. So exact opposite of buying something at 10 rand and watching it go to 11 to make the one rand profit. That selling what you don't own, that happens in the background. Don't stress that part of the equation. That will be managed by the provider that you use. Um, most of the time, it's going to be derivatives. So you're going to be using most likely CFDs, and they will be geared. In other words, that fall from 10 Rand to 9 Rand is a buck. It's 10%, but you were probably geared a couple of times. So you've made 30 or 40% back because you didn't put down the full 10 Rand. You put down, say, 5 Rand or 3 Rand, whatever the case may be. Your downside is uncapped with shorting because if you go long a stock, in other words, you're looking to make money on the upside, the share goes to zero, well, you've lost your money, but it ends. When you're short, as the share is rising, or the commodity, or the index, or whatever it is, as it is rising, well, you are losing, and they can rise forever and a day. So your downside is uncapped, but with strong discipline, stop losses and the like, uh, that's fine. You can manage the risk. Usually, short side is a lot more volatile. And what I mean by that is, for example, S&P 500 uh, spends about uh, uh, 10 or 15 percent of its life in bear market. In other words, 20 percent off highs. Yet half of the biggest days of the S&P are during those bear markets. So there's a lot more concentration. In, in a smaller space of time, if, if that makes sense as I'm saying it. And, and what that means is that you think something's going down and it does, and then it bounces. It bounces banana, oftentimes will stop you out, and then it carries on its way down. So it is very volatile and in many senses complex to do. I do very little shorting in my trading capacity. I'm mostly a long side trader. During bear markets, I move to cash uh, and I then outperform by being in cash. You know, markets are down, I'm not taking any positions, so I'm flat at zero. I'm not making money, but I'm also not losing. And that's because, particularly with your more volatile instruments, and that's particularly with equity, uh, indices less so, commodities less so, and FX even less so because of the volatility. Commodity, sorry, equities are your most uh, volatile, uh, commodities and indices in the next, and then FX right at the end. So that's a quick overlook of what we mean when we talk about shorting. Let's delve into some of the areas to look at where there might be potential shorts worth taking a look at. And we'll start with the US. Uh, literally 34 minutes ago, the US inflation for June came out and it was hot. 9.1. Market was expecting 8.8. Some folks were expecting 8.7, whatever you like, it came in at 9.1%. Immediate response, dollar strong, uh, US futures lower, South African markets lower, gold, even gold. Gold is supposed to be a hedge against inflation. Gold was falling. The inflation here in the US is what the worry is. More than just the headline CPI was core. So core takes out energy and those sort of costs. And the thing is, is that core inflation had actually been coming down the last couple of months whilst headline inflation was moving higher. Nice. And core is probably more important to, to, to central banks the world over, simply because, for example, energy costs. There's no supply and demand in energy. It's, I mean, there is at the extremes of it, um, but we still need to go to work, you know, et cetera. So we're still out and about and things are still being moved around. So that's generally considered to be outside of the ambit of the uh, 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 sort of the central bank and interest rates. But core went up. Inflation is baked. At some point it comes down, right? Because what's the best thing to kill inflation? Inflation. Let's take oil. Uh, oil is up, I don't know what it is, say it's double what it was a year ago. 
Okay, that's now in the, in, in the price. For inflation to stay at these levels, oil needs to double again. Brent going to 200? I mean, part of me hopes so because I'm long, but part of me not hopes so because I own a motor car. Um, but certainly the, the the headline at 9.1 was a shocker number. The core at 5.9 was a bigger shocker number. We've got a FAMC rate decision in two weeks today. Uh, it will be after our market close Wednesday 27, about 8 o'clock uh, Wednesday evening. They will talk, they will announce a new interest rate. Uh, the market is now betting on a full 1% increase. So 75 points was pretty much assumed regardless what inflation is. The futures market, the forward market, is now saying a 33% chance of a full 1% increase. I don't think so, but 75 points most definitely. And let's be clear. The last time the U.S. did a 75-point increase was at the previous meeting. The time before when the U.S. did a 75-point increase in interest rates, 1994. The last time the U.S. saw inflation at these levels, 1982. When inflation was lost at these levels, interest rates in the U.S., 15%. The Federal Reserve is behind the curve by 100 miles. And if you think they're bad, the ECB, the Bank of England, way, way worse. We've got an MPC meeting next week. We'll probably get a half a percent increase. Our central bank is not behind the curve. Our inflation is running hot. It's above the 6%, but we've been raising since last year. And let's quickly put this in perspective. About a year or so ago, uh, we suddenly saw the dot plots out of the Federal Reserve, uh, and suddenly it was talking about interest rate increases in 2023. Before that, rate increases had been for 2024. Here we are in the middle of 2022, and we are in full rate rising cycle. And central banks in developed markets, the world over, are behind the curve, which means they need to get proper aggressive, which means a recession is real. Now, quickly, let's touch on recession. The boffins out there will tell you that a recession is a 40% chance. Maybe it's a 50% chance. Technically, two negative quarters of GDP equals a recession. We've already had one in the U.S., Q1. Is Q2, Q2 going to be a recession? We'll find out in time. Um, or well, negative and therefore recession. Recession or not, it is tough out there. The only bright spot in the U.S. economic data is jobs. Jobs are still very strong. We saw the job start to coming out on Friday. What made up it? Uh, fuel oil, almost 100% gasoline. So gasoline, gas as they call it, is actually coming down. It's now uh, below $5 on average. Uh, electricity is not changing. Food, new cars, uh, transportation. None of this is massively changing. And some of them are skewed. Shelter is one of the biggest components in the, the CPR basket. It's only at 5.6%. But the national average for increase in home and shelter prices is 14%. So that one is actually lagging. Inflation isn't disappearing anytime soon. It is still coming. And at some point it does. But what it means is we've still got the high inflation. We've still got the Fed going aggressive on uh, uh, interest rates. Uh, and that then for we've still got concerns, real or otherwise, about a potential recession in the U.S., notwithstanding that the U.S. is in the highest interest rate environment in a long time and the highest uh, inflationary environment in four decades. And I stress, again, behind the curve on inflation. S&P earnings season kicks off tomorrow. Uh, growth of about 4.1 expected. That is mediocre at best. This is year on year. So this is against Q2 of 2021. And of course, Q2 of 2021, we were still in lockdown. We were still, <clears throat> excuse me, early days of the Delta variant. Remember Delta? So 4.1 is going to be modest. Uh, it's fine if we had, remember, markets care about expectations. So expectations 4.1, which is very modest. But if it comes in at 4.1, well, it hit expectation. If it comes in at five, it's beaten it. If it comes in at three, it's underwater. Where do I think? I think the risk is to the downside. The surprise here, risk is to the downside for bunches of reasons. Uh, consumers pulling back on, on, on spending because they're getting destroyed by uh, uh, gas prices, electricity, food, and all of those sort of things. Remember when our inflation comes out and everyone shakes their head and says, that's, my, that's not my inflation. The same's happening in the U.S., 
average American citizen is looking at 9.1 and saying, I wish I had 9.1. They've got a whole bunch more. So earnings season starts with the banks tomorrow, JP Morgan. Uh, it's going to be interesting because JP Morgan, for example, they've got the trading division. Good quarter, right? War in Russia. Well, war in Ukraine, sorry. Russia invading, uh, which is good for flows. But I, what I want to see, they don't have a very big sort of private banking, uh, you know, to personal banking, but I want to see what that's starting to look like. Are we seeing stresses and loan delinquencies? Credit cards, which were short-term credit in the U.S., is at the highest level in years. Uh, savings rates are below pre-pandemic. Uh, the April data for unsecured debt credit cards in the U.S., and April's the last latest month that we have, was fully up 20%. On March, one month, 20%. And when you think about it, that seems like a giant number. But in your own individual household, to push your credit card 20% further, if you're not hitting the cap, entirely possible. American consumer is under pressure. As I said, the only bright spot right now is employment data. Quick look at U.S. short interests. This is to mid-June. Um, and short answer, uh, days to cover is 3.6 and short interest over time. Uh, 3 billion. Both of those are relatively low. Um, I expect those to start to rise. It's also sometimes a bit of a, of a, of a contrarian. I mean, let's look at, at, I mean, short interest in, in 2020 was quite low. Eh, actually, surprisingly low for Q3, Q4. But by then the market had started to rally. But look at that short interest in Q1, Q2. And, and the market was going crazy. Yes, the market did peak late Q4. But man, by then, there'd been a lot of build-up and short interest. So S&P 500, all the charts are at close for yesterday, 12 July. In other words, in some cases, they're out of date already. I use the VOO here because I get the candles, uh, which give me a much better indication of what's happening. Um, and we're going back a, a year on, all of, on most of these charts, with a few exceptions. And I'll point out those exceptions. Uh, this is a chart you want to be short of. Your target here is, uh, I mean, probably, I, I think we're at least 10% lower. We're going down to about 33,050, maybe 3,100 on the S&P. Uh, I mean, just from a, a purely technical perspective, I have lost my mouse. Where is my mouse? There it is back. Um, not quite a double top, but certainly what we had was what a train of lower highs uh, and if we break that level there, we now have a train of lower lows to follow it as well. This is a bearish chart. Uh, subsequent to the to the inflation data coming out, U.S. futures have collapsed. I think there's easy another 10% downside on on the the S&P 500. Currently, it's at about 20% down. Uh, year to date, that'll take it to 30% down. Here's a fun fact: the median return on markets in a, in a recessionary environment in the U.S., minus 33%. Median return in non-recessionary environments, minus 11. We're at 22, minus, for the S&P. So we're halfway. But the market is currently undecided. I think the market is going to start erring onto the, so inflation's bad, Fed's going to be aggressive for longer, ergo hard landing, ergo recession, ergo 33% more likely than 22% down. In other words, more weakness on the S&P 500. For me, this is about the easiest call. That coupled with the NASDAQ, where I would say short as well. Same looking chart, bunches of lower lows, kind of quasi double top just there uh, from June 2 through to July, that recent low there. The, the, the NASDAQ's been having a, a tough time of it, make no mistake of it, an extra tough time of it. But those NASDAQ stocks were overvalued. Well, let me rephrase that. Let's people out here. Those NASDAQ stocks were highly valued. And now we've got a space where, you know, cash is, is short and uh, people are, 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 are finding it, you know, less money, disposable income to spend. And so the story goes on. And I mean, I remember when Facebook did their Q1 earnings for this year and stock went to 240. And I said, this, you know, is still a short. And I took a load of pain for it. Well, it's still lower. And there's a lot of tech stocks in this earnings season who are disappointed at the first quarter earnings. Facebook, Netflix, bunches of them disappointed. 
which means they've got to pull rabbits out the hat because if they disappoint again, the market is not going to be happy. The market is going to punish them further. I know uh, uh, Facebook is 50% down. Netflix is 80% off those highs of last year. I get they're a long way down, but the market can take them still lower. And there's an important point, and this is a, a, an internal memo that leaked out of Uber about a month or so ago with a new CEO, and I'm not going to try and pronounce his name. It's unpronounceable uh, for my tongue. Um, it is it, Basically, he said, you know what? Nothing matters except cash. Nothing matters except cash. Total addressable market, forget that. Potential profits, forget that. Show me the cash and show it to me today. Shut down markets that don't generate positive cash flow. And the problem with some of these companies, Netflix, for example, is they assumed a lot longer runway of not needing to show cash. So S&P 500, easy short. NASDAQ 100, to my mind, those are the easy shorts out there. So let's bring it home to our local market. So it's a tough call. Um, if we have a quick look at the chart. We're not having as nearly a bad a time as the rest of global markets in terms of, 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 our, of our drawdown so far year to date. Um, we're about maybe 12 or 13% down for year to date in the market. We're certainly consolidating at, at around about, we're now just below 60,000 uh, as of uh, inflation data coming out a while ago. There's two contradictory pieces working against it. One is load shedding, the other is commodity prices. Load shedding is hurting. When, load, when stage six started 15 days ago, our round was 15.80, now it's 17.10. And that is just about load shedding. Commodity prices are under pressure, but they've been saving our bacon. A lot of the power here. So most recently, a lot of the good news here has been, thank you, NASPAS and Process, and the share buyback coming from that. But more direct to that, a lot of that over the last year and a half has been commodities. So there's two things here. Load shedding ends. Is it over? No, but we go back to pretending it's over until next time when it's not. And that will be positive for our market. That will be positive for our czar. Resources start to rally again um, or at least hold on and stop falling. Again, positive for it. The negative for our market would be resources carry on falling lower. And we'll touch on some of the resources in a moment. And if load shedding sort of continues. I know the president has promised to do something. I've got to be honest, I mean, he did a tweet on Monday where he promises to do something. It's been 14 years, and now we're going to do something about it. I've spoken a lot about how, in spite of government, uh, uh, industry, uh, uh, you know, the mines, the shopping centers, the office parks, private individuals are solving the problem by going off-grid, and that therefore takes demand away from, 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 from ESCOM. So at this point in time, top 40, what would my call be? It would be to do nothing. Below 59,000, you want to be short. Above 62,000, you want to be long. If you want, you can trade that range. That's not my style of trading, but you could certainly trade that range. If I had a bias to this, I would say be short, but I wouldn't be taking it until we get more confirmation. On these charts here in the US, I wouldn't even wait for confirmation. I would take the shorts. I, I would jump them, no problem whatsoever. Here, I would be a little more circumspect and wait for something to happen. As I said, you can trade that range. It's what, uh, two, 3,000 points, uh, call that 4.5%. That is absolutely a tradable range. And there's plenty of money to be made there. We'll wait for 62,000 on the upside, 59,000 on the downside, uh, and take those as your entry points. Commodities. So the commodity story, and I did a webcast for markets.com recently. I spoke about commodities. I was bullish. And then all the wheels started to fall off with rampant inflation, uh, central banks behind the curve, rising interest rates, squeezing consumers, worries about recessions, et cetera, et cetera. And quite simply, that's bad for, for, for commodity demand, right? Because commodities is, is consumption. And I appreciate that it's not consumption from me and you so much, although oil to a degree, be it in fuel, energy, plastics, whatever the case may be, um, it's governments because of tax receipts and the like. It's China. China's doing mass testing again. Are they going to do some more hard lockdowns in some of their big cities again? If so, that's going to hurt commodities. 
We're still seeing chip shortages coming through, uh, which is hurting demand for PGMs because motor cars aren't being built fast enough. We're still seeing uh, the war in Ukraine, which is hurting uh, soft commodities, uh, wheat and maize most notably, um, and then oil. But and when I say hurting, hurting supply, so prices are remaining elevated. And when I'm talking commodities here, I'm not looking at the softs and the exotics because they're hard to trade. So I'm looking at the two that matter most. They've been falling, but high inflation is typically good for commodities, especially energy stocks. And there's a further caveat of what's good for, for commodities is a high, is a strong dollar, which is what we're seeing. And I'm going to come to that in a bunch more detail in some time. So the short answer is, is that this inflation environment should be good for commodities. A lot of that might be bulk commodities, your iron ores and the like, your industrials, magnesium, zinc, uh, copper, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm going to focus on oil and Brent. So I am currently long Brent. I, I initially, I was, I was trading that range between 100 and about 113. So buying, selling, buying, selling. What I would do is I would, I would, I had a position. I had a position from way back somewhere here. No, somewhere here last year. Yeah, about $70 a barrel. I had a position in, in Brent. Uh, I've kept it. And then I sold half in this spike up here. And then I would double up at 100. And I would halve, sell half at 113. Double up at 100, half at 113. Uh, and I've been doing that for a while. Uh, and more recently, I have again doubled up because we are now back below 100. If we see much further weakness below 100 than a short on oil, absolutely. And that's going to be driven by global GDP slowing down. Recession or not, GDP for 2022 and probably 2023 is being revised downwards and it's not going to be a staggeringly fun number. But if this level holds, if the 99, 98, 100 level holds, you want to be long. OPEC came out yesterday. They expect demand for 2023 to be higher than 2022. Less growth, but of course less growth because 21 was you know, lockdown. 2020 was hard lockdown. Um, they're, they're, the countries are the OPEC members, of which, of course, OPEC plus Russia is one of the biggest members after Saudi Arabia, struggling to increase production. Russia is selling their oil. Um, much as they're selling their gas into Western Europe, the oil is probably going to China. Some of it was allegedly going to India, and some of it's probably going into Europe. There's been no embargo. There's a lot of talk around embargoes, around sanctions on Russian oil, uh, is it, and, and probably seaborne into Europe. There's been a lot of talk around it, but the war is now almost four months old, and we have made no headway on it. Of course, Oil sales and gas sales are funding Putin's war. Make no mistake about that. But the oil is still flowing. But if we go into recession, then, and if Russian oil continues to flow, and we go into recession, we've seen rig counts in the U.S. tick up, although not massively as we have in previous. And a quick point on that. So 10 years ago, rig counts in the U.S., Every, you know, they, they almost, as oil ran, the number of rigs came back online. And then oil came down and rigs went offline. Then we had a protracted period of, of low oil price. So a lot of rigs went offline. And what happens is people get laid off and they eventually they give up waiting for a new job. So they go, they move somewhere else. They find another job. The rigs that have been taken out of commission get dumped in a, in a field or a storage facility and basically get cannibalized for spare parts. You've got a work, you've got a production rig, you need a spare part, you go to that one lying not used and you take a part from it. The manufacturers of the rigs are downscaling. So the whole industry contracts. Now there's demand. But that spare rig you've got in your, in your storage, you can't use because you've, sold, you've, you've cannibalized it for spare parts. You go back to the manufacturer, they're getting overwhelmed with demand for rigs and parts. But what did they do? They scaled back. So the, the, the flexibility to, to adapt has been seriously hindered uh, due to a protracted period of, of, of lower oil price. And now, of course, we've got the higher oil price. Um, and we'll see. As I said, a, 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 a strong break lower, you can take a short. Otherwise, your oil position, be long. Gold, this gold chart's out of date because gold fell to 1910, sorry, 1710, my bad, on the news, which puts it down sort of back at about that level there. You got to say, what is rule number one of gold? You want to hold it for inflation. That has been the story about gold 
for as long as I can remember. And I'm going back to the 80s when I first discovered stock markets. When you've got inflation, you want gold. Well, it turns out that's not true. When you've got inflation, you want cash. Apparently, it seems to. Now, of course, that's counterintuitive because you've got 100 bucks today or dollars. In a year's time, it's worth uh, uh, 891. Even cash is a depreciating asset. But gold is not holding up the way one would expect it to. So the short answer for gold, as much as it's counterintuitive, if it breaks, you want to take a short. I mean, it makes no sense. But this might be the break. You could say 1700 zit. You could say 1710. If you want to trade the bounce and you've got some, some courage of your convictions, this might be a long trade to take. But that is not a very bullish looking chart. Currencies. Currencies have been a weird beast. Um, well, not a weird beast. It's basically been, been one way traffic for, for currencies. The US dollar is strong, very strong. A dollar hit parity, euro hit parity. So, I mean, to the to the exact cent, it happened uh, uh, about 20 minutes ago. Well, no, about 40 minutes ago when the inflation number broke. But the US dollar is very, very strong. There is the dollar chart. And this chart goes back 20 years. Almost the strongest it's been in 20 years. The euro is back where it was 20 years ago at parity. Why? So the story is quite simple. Fear. People are worried about all those things I mentioned up front. Inflation, rising interest rates, recessions, war in Europe. So the list goes on. And if all of those are concerns, well, you want to go somewhere where your money is safe. Where's your money safe? U.S. dollar. Buy U.S. treasury bills. Yes, inflation's 9% and your treasury bills paying you 25 maybe 3 depending what duration you buy. But at least it's safe. In times of go-go, of the heydays, it's uh, I want to return on my money. In the times of uncertainty and fear, you want to return of your money. You want your money back. So people are buying dollars to move themselves into to get themselves into what they call safe assets. Slowing or, or, or slower or slowing interest rates will halt or reverse that U.S. strength. But that slide I did yesterday and the U.S. inflation of earlier today put paid to that. So that is no longer applicable at all. Uh, that will happen in time. But right now, this is a strong dollar environment. Strong dollar, as a rule, really good for commodities. Commodities are priced in dollars across the board. And we've seen it across EM currencies, we've seen it across some, some uh, 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 sorry, developed market currencies and even some EM currencies. The RAND has been a little weird, and I'll come to the czar in a moment. Um, yeah, where's my czar chart? The RAND has been kind of holding on and in fact was bucking the trend on the, 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 the dollar here. And, and, and the reason was quite simple, and that was because of commodities. Because I, I know commodities are down from the levels of Q1, Q2 last year, but they're still fairly elevated. The miners are making profits hand over fist, not as much as the first half of last year, but plenty of it. And when they're making money hand over fist, uh, they are producing as much as they possibly can which means that they produce, they've got a dollar asset, they sell it, they turn it back into rands. That has been helping our rand. But since level six load shedding started 15 days ago, that trend has reversed. And in fact, the rand at 1710 is over a one year view, exactly in sync with this dollar index and moving weaker. So you don't want to short the US dollar, you want to be long the dollar and you want to short the other side, short the euro, short the czar. Pick your entry levels. In the case of the czar, watch out for load shedding. When that goes, things might change. And when we see uh, uh, if commodity prices start to rally hard again, I don't think they will, but I think oil has some upside. It doesn't help us. We don't produce oil. But if you're watching PGMs and, and iron ore and coal and the like, if those start to move again, uh, move higher, then then careful of any uh, uh, shorts on the, the, the RAND. But short the euro. Uh, parity, sure, it's going way through parity. Parity is just the beginning. And then crypto. So crypto really has just proved itself to be a leverage risk asset, and it will follow the S&P. Uh, at this chart here, so you got clipped off on the side. Crypto is just above 19,000. It was 21,000 this morning. It's come all the way back. Why? Well, because bad data is bad for crypto. 
You know, the idea that crypto was a store of value, the idea that crypto was a hedge against inflation, all the stories that we've fed around crypto, and I, I say crypto, I mean Bitcoin, I mean crypto, I mean whatever, all the stories that crypto was supposed to be that we've heard over the last decade, uh, a medium of exchange and all of that, it is not. It is not. It is quite simply a risk asset, and it acts like a leveraged risk asset. I mean, this, the Bitcoin is, what, 65 70% off the highs. NASDAQ's off 33 or whatever, and we're, we're worried about the NASDAQ. That's what you mean by leveraged. So it's kind of like a 3x S&P. You don't need leverage here because you've already got the leverage in the crypto. Uh, short on, the, on crypto, uh, where to? 15,000 next stop, 10,000, not impossible. There's a bad news story for crypto. Crypto was born and grew up in the go-go period of low rates and easy money. The whole decade from, from 2010 through to 2020, uh, and then of course 21, 22, when you know, the Federal Reserve was doing helicopter money and pumping into the market and zero interest rates and negative interest rates in parts of the world predating that, all of that, there was free, easy money flowing around and it wanted a home somewhere to make some outsized returns and that home was crypto. But the base has changed. The free, easy money, quantitative easing is gone. The Fed started quantitative tightening last month. The zero to very low interest rates are gone. We're in a high interest rate environment. The story for crypto has fundamentally changed. Does it get back to 60, 70,000 a Bitcoin? Sure, maybe. When? No idea. Anytime soon? No. If you're short S&P, you want to be short Bitcoin at the same time. They broadly act exactly the same. Slightly run myself, but I, and I can see some questions. Uh, I'll take questions. We've got loads of time for that. I've, I hope to finish in half an hour, but I've, 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 I've got time. I'm not going anywhere, so we'll take those questions. But let's take the closing. So short uh, S&P 500, Nasdaq, crypto, euro against dollar, and you can throw czar in there as well, but watch the czar trades. Maybe short top 40 uh, and maybe even gold or oil. Longs, gold or oil, US dollar. There's when 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 head of markets.com, Solomon, said to me, topic, short or not? Firstly, this was six weeks ago. And I'm like, yo, who knows what we're going to be looking at come 13 July 2022. Uh, you know, by then markets might have bottomed. It might be harder to do. I have to say, putting this presentation together uh, Monday, Tuesday this week was easier than I thought. And that inflation data point that came out an hour ago made it even easier. If that inflation had been... 8.5. And if core had gone down again, ooh, now it starts to get tricky. But this to me was, you know, the shorts on S&P, NASDAQ, crypto, and euro to me is easy. Top 40, maybe wait for that 50, 59,000 level. Gold, technically, if it breaks lower, you want to be short. Otherwise, you trade the bounce. Oil, I would be trading the bounce from here uh, with a tight stop, stop around 96. And if that breaks, uh, uh, swing it into a short and just take it directly into a short from that point. Ladies and gents, if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. We have ourselves some time. Uh, Chins, yes, it will be on YouTube. I'll stick it up on justonelap.com. It will be up there later this evening. Uh, in a couple of hours, I've got a podcast to record. I'll upload that, and I'll upload the video as well. Justonelap.com, you will find the video there. Individual stocks, a couple of folks asking about that. Um, I didn't target individual stocks at all for, for a couple of reasons. I think shorting individual stocks is far too – I didn't even trade individual stocks as a rule. There's too much volatility, too much single event risk. You know, you, 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 you know, I'm trying to think of an example, but you know, a CEO says something or a bad set of numbers or something like that, and you're suddenly you – know, the stock is 10 15 20% moved against you, and you're just getting – caned in the market, absolutely caned. I don't trade equity. They are too volatile. I stick to my trading. I, I, I mostly trade indices, but of commodities and from time to time FX. But my preferred is indices. That's where my trading is. And the other thing with stocks is there's just, you know, the, that universe is just massively giant and I don't spend my time uh, gazing at them. Uh, and earnings season coming up. And again, my bias to earnings season in the US is on the short side. Um, we can see what happens there, but uh, we'll start getting that data coming through. PGMs, 
I didn't mention PGMs because they're very difficult to trade unless you trade the miners, and the miners have already been clobbered. Um, the, the, the PGMs have all been under pressure, although uh, Palladium got its nose above 2,000 again this week. Uh, Platinum still in the 800s. Rhodium's well down. The trick with, with PGMs is quite simple. Uh, chips, uh, silicon chip supplies into motor cars. They couldn't get them. The average motor car has hundreds of chips of, of these little chips, and most of them are dumb chips. They're not smart things. They're running an indicator or a, a seat heater or whatever the case might might be. Um, but you need them for the car. You can't sell a car with you know five chips short. Or in the US, they've sun, done. They have sold some cars where your back seat heaters can no longer be controlled in the back, only in the front. Um, and, and that's just a, because they can't get the chips. So that was the big story, and we all thought that would resolve itself over the course of the year. It hasn't really been resolving itself. We've got new challenges that um, Neon, which is used in the process of ma manufacturing chips, because it's it, it's used in the clean rooms. Uh, most of that supply comes from Russia, and most of it is processed in Odessa, which is in Ukraine. Um, but now, of course, uh, fears around recession, fears around fuel prices, all of that sort of thing are making folks very, very spooked for for uh, buying new cars. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with a market that is just, just under pressure is the short answer. Absolutely under pressure. So at this point, I mean, Kay, with your with your SA40 and Markets.com uh, above 62,000. So either trade the range between 59 and 62,000, which is a, a currently quite a nice trading range. So short at 62,000, long at 59,000. Um, and if either of those levels break, if we break up through 62, take a, a long position. What would see us break up through 62? Uh, load shedding ending, and I don't mean ending for good. I just mean that I've got power all day tomorrow and not much of tomorrow or some of tomorrow or a little of tomorrow. Um, that will bring some positivity back into our market, although America is going to weigh on us. Um, and, of course, if commodities run. Uh, if, if, if the U.S. and global recession fears are weighing too heavily – and we don't get rid of the load shedding, uh, then a short down to 59,000 and a break below that is absolutely. So SA40, either trade that range, 59 to 62, or the break above 62 or below 59,000. Um, what about, yeah, I, so, so questions coming through around other altcoins and the like, they're all the same. They're all going to largely trade as uh, 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 Bitcoin does. It's why I just say crypto in, 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 in general. Uh, question around uh, uh, um, uh, oil and you know, can it go back to that 136? I mean, folks that I speak to who know this industry way more than I do, are scratching their head that oil's only 100. They think that's crazy. They think, I mean, the all-time high for oil is about 148 back in 2008. Inflation adjusted, that's about 215, 220. Um, and and, and we are, so we're a long, long, long way away from that. Um, it is an issue of demand to a degree. Uh, particularly as we come into into not even recession, just tough consumer. You know, you're spending so much money already on on paying down debt and interest rates and and food inflation and shelter and all of that sort of stuff. So you know, as I said, my bias and I'm talking my book here. I am long oil at this point. I've been uh, holding for a while, since about seventy seventy four dollars, and I've been trading the hundred to hundred and thirteen. So I doubled up. Uh, I think I doubled up was it this morning. I think I doubled up our, my position because we went sub 100, which is my current trading rule there. Folks, we will leave it there then. Uh, not seeing any more questions coming through. So your pocket video will be online later, um, uh, and I will. It will be on YouTube. I'll send it through to the 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 markets.com folks they can also grab it and they can email the link out to people it'll be sitting on the youtubes um we will be doing more of these most definitely uh markets.com you can go trade it's cfds indices uh equities commodities and uh, to me the biggie and sa40 so we can trade the local at the same time ladies and gents everyone have a good day further uh, stay safe look after yourself and as always if you can look after somebody else as well cheers all